Awesome. There we go. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, we're just still laughing at We're his... still like playing with this uh, new setup. <laughs> Yes. When he gets it right, he like I'm will like, go like, yes. he'll be like, yes, 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 yes. And then when he gets it wrong, he's just gone. Anyways, welcome guys. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome, fearless family. Um, yes. Happy to have you guys here. Um, interesting topic today. I think it's going to be a little bit different than what you guys are thinking it's going to be. Um, you know, how to analyze a property. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but. We're all still doing it wrong, so that's what Grand Victoria about. Nin, the first three on here. We should have a contest sometime for like the first person Nin to make a win. comment. Nin would <laughs> win. Grant yeah. Green from out east. Victoria from out west. Mike, Ottawa, Adele, Montreal, Cheryl, Ontario. Yeah, we've got lots of uh, Sean. Moody. I don't know Port Sean. Moody. Where is this from? Port Moody. I mm. love Port Moody. So pretty. Or no, just wait, I'm thinking Port. Yeah, you've uh, never been to Port. I'm thinking <laughs> Port. What's the one where we went on uh, that, that floating cabin? That was Port Al outside of Port Alberni. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm thinking yeah. Port. Oh, anyways, okay. I'm sure it's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> anyways, welcome, 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 guys. Port Elms Elmsley. So that's outside of um, Ottawa area. Ottawa as well, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Bernie and, and Awesome. Linda. Montreal. Victoria, All right, guys. So, okay. So who here Good. thinks you know how to analyze a property? And we, we have a general idea, right? But we're still seeing all the time properties that are being analyzed wrong. And this is by veteran investors. This is by, I shouldn't say veteran. If you're a veteran investor, you've been doing this for 10 years or longer, and you have multiple properties in a portfolio, you're probably doing it right. I shouldn't say that. But what I'm saying is people that have been doing this for two, three, four years and feel that they've got you know a real hang on it, but yet we're still seeing the numbers well, coming in not quite right. Let's let's be frank. It's, it's tough sometimes to find exactly what we're looking for, right? Yeah. Like it's tough to to find exactly the type of property in the right area that we want that fits all of the, it checks all the boxes. Um, and sometimes what we tend to do, and we're gonna talk about this in detail as we start to just smooth out and smudge those numbers a little bit. So we're gonna talk about that today. <laughs> and some other things that, you know, whether we're, we've are we been uh, buying properties for a long time or whether we're just looking to buy our first property, some things to watch out for, we have some, tips, uh, some biggest mistakes we see people making. So lots of really cool tips. We're going to go over, um, I'm kind of excited about it. We're going to go over a vacancy report from CMHC, just kind of show you some of the things we should look for, some of the things we should be looking out for when it comes to analyzing a property and doing our numbers. So really good stuff today, guys. Hope you can stay with us for the full hour or 45 minutes, whatever we're on here for. And uh, some really good stuff on how to analyze a property. And just speaking about um, analyzing properties and talk about commitment, Andrea and Sean, these guys, um, you know, analyzed markets, decided on Oshawa being their best bang for their buck, and so moved there. So you know, it's it's there's a lot of commitment as investors, um, but now as they're expanding their portfolio and looking for joint venture partners and changing it up in that way, now they know that they're in the right market to be able to do that. So, um, anyways, how though after you found your market, like we talked about what three weeks ago now in Fearless um, Training Tactical Tuesday Training, yep. now once you've chosen your market. What about the property itself? So Absolutely. we're not going to focus too much on the market stuff, although it kind of sometimes comes into play, but we are going to talk more about the property itself, the numbers and, you know, the mind games that we play with ourselves that really come and shoot us in the, in the butt after. So, you know, do we want to be in this long term? Do we want to be in this 10 years from now? Do we want to own that property long enough for it to be paid off by someone else? Or do we want to end up, having a property that we've come to hate, went from love to hate, um, and it takes us out of the game. That's pretty easy to do. Um, we see it all the time. We see bad decisions sure being is. made on the purchase, uh, you know, with with grandiose plans sometimes and, and well-intentioned plans sometimes. But um, some of the points we're going to share today can stop you from maybe making a mistake that sometimes can cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars um, and, and hopefully you can pick a little nugget out of what we're going to talk about today. Um, yes, I just, we got to say, so today we're in a different location. 
We are um, on a mini vacation for ourselves. Is that what we're calling it? Sure, let's call it that. We're in one of our own units. This is a furnished rental that we have here in Edmonton. Uh, and with a beautiful fire that I spent a long time creating in the background. Yeah, yes, it is. It is on our TV. Uh, we thought we'd try to make uh, uh, it look as cool as possible, so but guy's... we're really stretching. We're really stretching to do it in here. <laughs> this is this is a property of ours that um, we've had since 2007. It was one of the last ones that we bought. It was Thank... the last one we bought. Was it? Yeah. So thank goodness we knew what to watch for and knew that the market was starting to become super overheated um, for what Edmonton, which is our, our home market, um, could really do. So we actually stopped buying, made a conscience effort in March of 2007 to stop buying. Um, and when we made that effort, thank goodness we did because things started to change drastically after that but this is one of the last ones that we bought. We bought it on a BTB, full, full BTB, right? Did we put any money down on this? uh full vtb you're right full vtb yeah um which we plan to pay out within two years i think and then we didn't end up so we had to renegotiate that for the, another two or three years anyways then that didn't work out very well um we ended up having the tenants that had been paying like 14 or 1500 dollars a month in rent ended up you know moving out and then we realized oh this is no, exactly were, what we're we, talking about we were getting 11 1200 dollars in rent that was it i don't know no, 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 not from the very first that very first couple that oh, was in okay, here. Okay, okay. When we bought it from, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. They were like fourteen fifty, I think, or fifteen hundred. Even it was like, woohoo! You know, this is a great property. So we bought it without really analyzing our numbers. And then when they moved out a couple of years later, we realized that we could only get eleven right. to twelve hundred yeah. a month for this place. Yeah. So. Again, and that didn't cut it. Bit. I mean, we were negative no. cash flow at that point. And so this is not our topic for tonight, but we're, but, it fits but you know what? Lot. It does fit because we didn't analyze the prop the property properly. Yeah. And, and we got caught up we, in the no money exactly, down. And we got caught up in VTB. the, Hey, we can buy it and VTB and low. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it didn't cash flow. It was negative. So we pivoted. We made some uh, choices that, you know what, we had some extra furniture at home. We we had some extra things we were going to throw in. So why don't we bring some of our stuff here? We brought one of our older sofas, older chairs, some of our lights and and, and uh, stuff we had on the wall at home. We brought it here. It, it cost us less than $4,000. I know that to fully furnish the entire place and uh, get the cutlery like and that. get the toasters and get everything that we needed to put in here. And it, it, it really didn't cost us anything, uh, less than $4,000. And it jumped our rent from struggling to find tenants for $1,100, $1,200 a month. And immediately at that time, we were getting uh, $2,000, $2,100 a month even. just by putting in uh, less than $4,000 worth of furniture. So, um, you know, the advertising changed, all that stuff. Long story short, it ended up working out. We, we love the place now. Um, and we have it on Airbnb and it works really, really well. But um, yeah, you got to sometimes pivot. And one of the points we're going to talk about today is having a plan B when it comes to your investments, because sometimes it doesn't work out the way you planned it from the beginning. So number point number one, we're going to quickly run through what we're going to be talking about today, and then we'll get through to each of those points. So point number one is know your strategy and analyze for that strategy. Our strategy was a long-term buy and hold with this property. Well, guess what? <laughs> we didn't analyze the numbers properly for that strategy, and it ended up we having to pivot into being a short-term rental and then into a corporate rental and then into now an Airbnb as well. So listen, you have to know your market, what strategy works there, and then you have to analyze that property for that strategy. So that's point number one we're going to dive into in a little bit here. Um, point number two is be real in your numbers. So it's amazing how we can talk ourselves into it. We just talked about that with this place here. We it was great. We were so excited. It was a full on B VTB. I don't know. I never even met the guy that we bought it from. Yeah. I think you might have or yeah. whatever, but like it was just, it was exciting and it seemed great, but I'll tell you what we assumed and took over a mortgage far beyond what we should have um, for this kind of, place and that, that property, but we were so wrapped up in the deal and the BTB side of things and getting that deal that we didn't analyze real numbers for how this property was going to play out for the next 10, 15 years. We've had it since 2007. Mm -hmm. So what is this now? 2020. So 13 years. Um, we didn't, we didn't analyze it. We didn't go through it. So 
uh, be real in your numbers. And we're going to talk about how to be real in your numbers, what numbers to go through. Point number three is performa numbers versus real wor world numbers. Mm -hmm. So how do you figure out what vacancy rate to use? How do you figure out what maintenance um, allowance to put in? Um, property management, all that kind of stuff. How do you figure They're out- They're not the same numbers? for every property. They're not, They're not the, the same. same for one condo to the next or one building to the next or one complex to the next or one street to the next. These things can change per property. So it really is important to make sure that we nail down some of these numbers prior to us buying the property, if at all possible, um, because that comes into the decision making as to, are we gonna buy property A, B or C? You know, we have to analyze these things properly. We can buy the exact same property on one side of the street. And I did not realize this until I became a realtor and started really looking inside the numbers, but you can buy one property on one side of the street and the same exact property on the other side of the street other side of the track, so to speak. Um, and it can make a world of a difference on the amount of rent you're gonna get, the amount of price that you're gonna buy it for and potentially sell it for in the future. Um, so there's so many factors to consider. Yeah, so that's what we're gonna talk about, okay? So that's what we're gonna go into a little bit. Number four is um, the biggest mistakes that we see people making. And then if we have time, we're gonna add in a couple of pro tips, a couple of things that you can do to kind of vet your stuff a little bit better that maybe you weren't thinking um, you know, is a huge deal, but has really made a huge difference in our investing anyways, um, on the long term. So, yeah. um, hey, Sean and Heidi, haven't seen you guys for a while, hey, hey. Um, okay, so, that's, those are our four points, okay? So number one, know your strategy and analyze for that strategy. So what are some of the things that we um, will do? Now, for example, this story, we just told you about this place that we bought 13 years ago. Um, we we didn't analyze it for the strategy that we were buying it for. We just analyzed it for, woohoo, we can get a no money down deal. Right, so sometimes we look at it and say, wow, the ROI is super high if I was to buy it now and hold it for a year and or 12 you know, years, renovate it to. or, <laughs> you know, like, or, or maybe, maybe the numbers look really good. The cash flow is not great, but the ROI is super great. Or maybe it's the opposite and the cash flow is super high, but the ROI, you know, we're not expecting prices to go up. We're not, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Of so you, you have to understand your strategy first of all. So don't you, the, you have to decide what you're going to do with that property. So, for example, with this one, yes, I, and I know I'm putting you on the spot because we didn't talk about this part, but how, we overpaid for this. So Absolutely. How much did, so, how much did we overpay? Well, we paid two hundred and thirty-eight thousand for this particular property. Okay. Okay. It was a one-bedroom condo in West Edmonton. Okay. Brand new at the time. One bedroom plus den. Plus den. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I'll give you that. Okay. So we paid two hundred and thirty-eight thousand for this. Okay. Um, what was it worth? Because it was not worth. It was well. Here's the thing. They were selling for that price at the time. They okay. were selling for between 230 we and 240 at the time. Okay. And, but you know what? When I look back in history at the numbers, the highest that any one bedroom has ever sold in this building is 250,000. So we paid pretty much near the peak when it comes to this building. Now, that's just what happened and our timing wasn't good. But because but, we didn't analyze for the strategy that we were buying it, okay? We were buying for a long-term hold. All we saw, all we saw was, woohoo, we can get a break-even property and it's no money down. So let's do it. Yeah. But what we didn't think about was 13 years down the road, when we have this property and have had it for 13 years, if it's not cash flowing, what kind of effect is that going to have on our life? Even $100 a month negative. We if did you that, were to take that more times than $100 you can count. a month negative times. 12 months is $1,200 a year times 10 years. Well, that's easily $12,000. Now, times. what if what if you have 10 properties? It, you know, or that's, years, that's 120 grand. You know, so this is where it starts to really add up the more properties you have. So you got to make sure that as you purchase, you're purchasing correctly and based on the strategy that you're trying to employ. So if I'm trying to flip, if I'm buying this at $238,000, in 2007 and I'm looking to flip it, would that be smart? Absolutely not. And this so ties in with choosing your market. We were not, we got caught up in the fact that Edmonton's market in 2004, five, six, and seven was doing nothing but skyrocketing up. Nothing but skyrocketing up. It was and so fun. because it was going up, we assumed it's always gonna go up. 
and we ended up buying this one at the peak. And it's actually been worth less than 200,000 for almost the entire time we bought it. And I think right now, if I wanted to put this on the market, it'd be worth about 185, 190,000 at the most. Okay, so. Okay. So, but how do I get this comment off now? <laughs> you gotta click the same comment. Okay, so, thank you. Sorry, Rachel, yeah. or Rochelle. Why do I always do that, Rochelle? Um, there we go, thanks. Um, okay, so, but do we care? Because we're not selling it. Now, if we hadn't pivoted and made it into a short-term rental and weren't making $700 a month off of this property, right now we're doing some a little bit of renovations, so it's vacant. But other than that, even through all of COVID, it's been fully, fully rented. Mm -hmm. So we're making $700 a month off of it. I don't care what, That's what the, the thing. price is. Who cares if it goes up or down? It could be worth 5 bucks. Hi from a rental project. But if we're making $700 a month in cash flow because we rent it out the way we're doing it now, I could care less. I'm not planning to sell it. So we're planning to hold this for a long term. That was our plan from the beginning. So whatever the prices do, go up, go down, whatever, that's irrelevant to me because we're making the cash flow on it. Now, so, if we weren't making the cash flow, it would be extremely relevant, right? Yeah. So, so this is where analyzing comes in, which we're talking yeah, about tonight. If your strategy is to buy that property and hold on to it or, or flip it within the next say three to five years, whether you do work to it or not, whether you allow the market to do the appreciating or, you know, do some, some active appreciation, what doesn't matter which way it is, you want to get the proper comps. You want to make sure that you're getting the right numbers from the right people. Um, you know, realtors, yes, appraisers, even if you're not sure on those numbers, pay an appraiser the 300 bucks. Believe me, you're going to waste far more money than that. Um, if you don't get that done. So, and then the other thing, point number one um, is, is researching proper rents. So how do we do that? There's across of Canada anyways, and I know some of you are tuning in from the States, but from across Canada, there's um, like rentfaster, for example, .ca. You can go in there and you can look at similar properties. So you can do an add up yourself and then you can say, show me similar properties within one kilometer, three kilometers, five kilometers, whatever it might be. And they will show you what what rents are street rents now here's the difference so cmhc has rents but they're from all the big guys they're from you know main street and and all these big guys that that rent massive you know properties we're just little guys so we don't report to cmhc they don't really reflect the kind of ma and pa rents that we get so what you want to do is you want to find those spots so that might be in a local landlords association that might be um you know by going on something like rent faster or whatever's in your area that tells you what average rents are posted for now posted not what they're renting for necessarily but what they're posted for um so comparable prices comparable rents and make sure that that fits the strategy that you're looking for. Is that 13 years down the road or is that three years down the road? Make sure well, that just, fits. Well, just a little pro tip that goes along with what you're saying is if you are wondering what would this property rent for, pretend you are a tenant looking for that type of property. That is the easiest way to find out. If you were a tenant looking for that type of property, what would you do? You would type in, I'm looking for a three bedroom house and blah, 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 blah. You would hit enter and you would have your rental sites come up. Check out those rental sites, the same as if you were a tenant. Yeah. Check out those rental sites and see what those type of houses are going for, those properties are going for. That's the easiest way to compare it. Yeah. So, Or even do a ghost ad. So absolutely. you can throw on a ghost ad. So where, and people say, well, do you ethically think that's fine? I don't know. I've never had an issue with that. I throw on a ghost ad and I just kind of say, you know, looking to get, you know, this much money for rent, just so you know, may not be available for a couple of months, you know, but I just kind of gauge the interest and see what are people willing to pay for that. So that's what you, you need those numbers. Okay. It's not about VTBs. It's not about AFS. It's not about no money down. It's not about any of that stuff because it's those things that are so attractive, but I can tell you some of the most creative and successful investors that I know and have met in the last 20 years have also lost their shirts because because they didn't analyze those those um, properties for the strategy they're looking at. They more analyze them out of the no money down deal and how exciting and creative it can get, which is super cool and super fun, but it's not gonna help you 10 years down the road. 
So that's um, that's point number one. Okay. Make so sure just that you're quickly before we move on, um, Elaine here is asking, I've never been a tenant. So what sites would I look at? So Elaine, just simply pretend you are a so tenant. So go to Google, uh, like Google it. Go to Google, type in the search bar. I'm looking for this type of property. Well, you just, you so, probably put three bedroom in, um, I can't remember the little area you're outside Merricksville, of. Merricksville, I think. Merricksville. Something um, like that. <laughs> so, or in, in uh, not Lethbridge, Medicine Hat or whatever it might be. So type those in, three bedroom, Medicine Hat, basement suites. And that's what's going to come up or are those sites that are um, SEO driven. So have search engine optimization that bring people, renters to their site and thus your property. So just pretend you are Googling it and what would you type in? And that's that's the top sites that you're gonna find are right now ranking the best. And those are the ones that you know that, woohoo, they're Easiest gonna bring way to people. find that is pretend you are one. Yeah. So that that's kind of the, the overall point on how you go about doing that, what sites you look at, that's all up to there you in your area. There's different sites for different areas of the country, but pretend you're a tenant. Uh, do the searches that a, a typical tenant would do and you're going to come up with that. And Sean search. and Heidi are, I don't know if you've met them yet. Um, they are just, oh, well, they're in Ottawa, I think, in. Um, and um, Elaine and Harry are just outside of Ottawa. So they said that Kijiji and Facebook Marketplace works best or works good for them. So, um, okay. So number two, figuring out cash flows using all expenses. So really important that we make sure of certain things. So we're going to, Corey's going to go through a vacancy report and kind of show you some of the things to look for. That's on number three though. Sorry. Oh. In, in a minute. <laughs> um, but um, in the meantime, we're just going to talk about a couple of things. So vacancy rates, for example, we see a lot of people that will say, oh, the vacancy rate in my city. Now let's just use Toronto as an example. Yeah. The vacancy rate in my city is 4%. So I'm going to use 4%. And we see this time and time again on performance. However, you think about Toronto, a city of millions of people and, million, and, and hundreds, tens of maybe thousands of neighborhoods. Um, you know, you're using a very macro number, a number that's a bird's eye view number for a very micro property. Okay. A very micro situation. So if you think, you know, if I used a Canadian number to signify, you know, what's happening in my properties, you'd say I'm crazy, but yet we do the same thing. We look at a macro number, like for example, Toronto, when really like, you know, when we have a certain property in a certain neighborhood in on a certain street that can have huge differences i'll never forget um how i had one investor this was years and years ago our our vacancy rate was listed at three percent at the time um, but really we were down about one percent at the time because cmhc is about six months behind and i mean we were you know we had 12 people lining up for viewing showings whatever so um, that was our market. And yet there was one pocket of the market we were investing in that was at 14%. And so there were investors just flocking there because prices were amazing on these properties. And I'm yeah. like, okay, but stop. Have you looked at the map? Let me show you. It's 14% vacancy rate. And they're like, what? Edmonton's at 3%. Like, yeah, but not that area. So vacancy rates are super important and you need to really drill down. Where can you get that kind of information? Of course, going to show you a couple places and then how to analyze it yourself. Um, but there's, you know, you have to dig deep sometimes for vacancy rates. Let me just say CMHC is usually behind. Okay. Plus, they well, don't. They're really, all behind. Plus, they don't really represent the mom pause. But if you look into like, um, you know, your areas, your boards, your real estate boards, your tenant landlord associations, your all of those kinds of places, they usually have more up to date and more reliable information that's a little more specific. And, and here's the thing. Let's say I can't find something. Okay. Let's say I do all the research and I'm buying in a town where they don't publish this kind of information. Um, it's, it's difficult to find, um, you know, take the information from the nearest large center and then I would almost double it. I would almost just be super, super conservative. And that's really, really important. And that was actually, I think, point number. Anyways, they changed it all. One of the Sorry. points. <laughs> <laughs> so being conservative in our numbers is, is the most important thing of all. So even if, even if you found that CMHC says that this particular neighborhood is at 4% vacancy, 
Does that mean I throw 4% vacancy on my, on my uh, performer when I'm trying to figure this stuff out? No, I'm probably going to put a five or a six or a seven. Why? Because I want to be conservative. Now, these numbers, just because I put 7% on a performer when I'm analyzing a property, doesn't mean that 7% is coming out of my bank account every single month. And this is the, the important part to all of this is that these numbers that we use on our spreadsheets when we're analyzing a property, they are just to help us analyze. They're not real world numbers. And there's a difference between the numbers that we analyze with just to determine whether it's good or not and real world numbers. Because let's face it, if there's a tenant in that property that I bought, there's zero vacancy. So all of that 7% or 6% or 5% that I accounted for on the Performa is going straight into my bank account. That is cash flow. So there's a difference between performa numbers that help us analyze and real life numbers that's what's going in and out of our bank accounts. There's a big difference between those two. What we want to do is we want to make our decisions when we're analyzing a property super, super conservative. So here's here's another way we can do that. And it's something, again, we're seeing all the time. So, you know, a lot of developers right now and, and realtors and stuff are getting really smart and and really great for us as investors and in that they're providing properties for us now that often include like property management, for example. Um, so they might be a brand new property. So they, so we think, oh, well, we don't really need much for maintenance because they're brand new and they have warranty. And secondly, they're also property managed. So I don't have to put in a number for property management. But here's the thing. They're usually property managed for two years, let's say, on average. Um, sometimes one, sometimes three, but let's say two years. So now what's going to happen after that two years? You're going, if you're going like point number one, you're going to hold on to that. And that's your strategy to be holding it past that one or two year point when the rents are guaranteed and when property management is included, you need to be accounting for what's going to happen after. So your performa, your, you know, analysis of that property needs to include now you can then ignore it after, but it needs to include property management that's coming in, whether or not it's provided whether or not it's, where are you going, you weirdo? Oh, 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 the fireplace. Ah, ah. <laughs> um, so you need to be including that, okay? So don't, just because it's included, don't exclude that. Let's talk about maintenance for a minute. Maintenance is huge. So, stop it, it's music. Oh, okay. Um, so maintenance on property man or on properties, we see this huge span. But you know what's interesting is there's a lot of properties that you need to be counting in about 10% of your rents for maintenance. Yet we do not often see people very, 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 very rarely putting 10% as maintenance fee. But guess what? In the real world, an older property is going to have if they have older appliances, if they've got, you know, whatever, issues of, of, of you know, leaking roofs and windows that get condensation. Those are big costs, right? Big costs. These are big so things. So th these big things come in. If we spend $4,000 on putting a new furnace in our property, for example, you divide that over, uh, over a 12-month period in that year. And what does that work out to be? That works out to be several hundred dollars a year. Three, three, four hundred. Sorry, three hundred and fifty dollars a month, roughly, that comes out of our cash flow if we have to replace it that year. So some of those big costs can really put a dent in our repairs and maintenance budget. Absolutely, and so, that that ties in with our reserve fund. That ties in with our reserve fund. Here's the thing, guys, that I see uh, a big mistake that a lot of investors make right off the bat is, yeah, they might account for eight percent repairs and maintenance on a particular property. But if something goes wrong in that first, second month, what if something goes wrong in that first year and I've only collected $500 so far and now I got to replace something big? You have to have a reserve fund. Your repairs and maintenance allowance that you're counting on are $50, $100, uh, even $150 a month, putting it aside, might not cover that yet. So you have to have a reserve fund right from the very, very beginning. And that comes into analyzing that property. How much should I have right off the bat to do renovations, but also to set aside as a reserve 
so that if something goes wrong on this property versus that property over there, I might have to have different reserve fund amounts. So it comes into analyzing a property, absolutely. For sure, and and I think you kind of touched on it, but I just want to go in a little bit more. I don't know, so as you guys, well, actually we didn't introduce ourselves. Again, we're Corey and Tiffany Young, we're um, the founders of Investor Life. We've owned over 100 properties for 18 years-ish, um, and you know, one thing that we've learned is that you can't almost count on anything in investing. And so that's why we do this show and share with others. So, you know, one thing that we've seen a lot of is that, you know, um, so, oh, by the way, we did everything by having joint venture partners. So people gave us our money, we invested it with them and split any profits. Now, I don't know about you, but the very worst thing I can almost even imagine is going to a partner and having to ask them for money. That stressed me out beyond words. So before I learned that the proper way to do this would be to put in a reserve fund, I just thought to myself, how, like, I don't want to have a partner and then have to ask them for money. Well, guess what? I never, I never had to. You get a reserve fund of about three months um, rent, worth of rent. So if rent is 1500, you're gonna have a reserve fund of $4,500. And that's just to have it. That's not yeah. if you know of known, known other issues. Like if you know that windows are gonna be replaced, add more to that yeah. reserve fund. Yeah. Um, that's just as your minimum. And we never had to go to a joint venture partner and ask them for money because we had, if something came up, we the knew money, the funds were there. The funds yeah. were there. We could sleep. And exactly, George, you're asking what percentage would you use for a reserve fund? So we usually just use three months gross rent. Um, that would be kind of a minimum when it came to what our reserve fund would be. Sometimes it was significantly higher than that. If we anticipated that this could go wrong in the first year, that could go wrong in the first uh, the first 12 months. So let's put the money aside for these things in the reserve fund in case they do go wrong. So yeah. Um, yeah, depending on the property, that will determine how big of a reserve fund you go. But I would say a minimum of three months gross rent is what I would put aside. And we'll just answer this, sir. We don't know who you are, but um, do you have separate bank accounts for each property? So no, we do not. <laughs> and no, would we, we would never. So we got to know. Well, we did at property, one time. Yeah, property number 28 with 28 different bank accounts. Total nightmare, we were told. And so we followed the advice that it's best to do it that way because then all your accounting is built in for you. Your bookkeeping is practically done for you on the banking statement. Um, heck no. <laughs> it was a major mess and then a major mess to get out of. So no, we don't. And you have to keep that money separate. Some people say that reserve fund doesn't have to be in a trust account. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be in a separate account at all. It just has to be available you know, how you, whether you've talked to your joint venture partners, you know, how you've structured your bank accounts for you to be able to write from it. Now, let's say you have $4,500 a month or sort of $4,500 in a reserve fund, but you've decided that you don't want, let's say your joint venture partner, your money partner says, well, I only want you to spend, like if it's anything over 500 bucks or anything over a thousand bucks, like I, I want to know about it. Then there's also a line in there in your agreement that says, Okay, the reserve fund is 4,500, but no one item can be paid for for more than 500 or 900 or whatever threshold you set without talking to your joint venture partner. But reserve funds, guys, are for you. It's hard to ask a partner for a reserve fund. You're already asking them for lawyers fees, closing costs, down payment money, all that stuff. But trust me, you can sleep at night a whole lot better knowing that there's five to 10 to 15 grand, whatever the number is, sitting there for if anything goes wrong, you don't have to go to your partners and be like, hey, so. Yeah, so, yeah. so you know what, and, and Liz's question ties in with this, is, yeah. an, is an available line of credit okay for a reserve fund? That's fine for a property that you might be buying on your own. Um, what you want to do though, is what we're really talking about here is when you're buying a property potentially with partners where they're supplying the down payment, they're supplying the reserve fund. So we want to include that as part of the cash investment from them up front. We would much prefer that than having a line of credit or something at that point. If you're buying the property in your own and maybe you're paying the down payment out of a line of credit, um, then having the reserve fund set aside or a certain amount of line of credit would be fine. Um, but if you are working with partners, I would prefer cash so that you know they're not having to dip into it. I'm not having to make that phone call. They're not having to write a check, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Karen, okay, Nin will help set you up to figure that out. 
how to get it so that it works for you. Um, Melanie has a question too, where your partner's comfortable not being able to see the ins and outs of your property only. So um, yeah, at first we gave them like view only access to each of those accounts. But after a while we were like, no way, man. Like it was just way too complicated. So yeah, for the most part they were. Now those that weren't, you can say to them, so let's do a quarterly report for, for the first year. So you can see how things work. Then we'll do an annual report. Or if they're a little nervous, you can do a report every six months. Um, or sometimes, you know, as money partners, you, you, you're you just listening to them and finding out what they want. You might just say to them, okay, well, we're going to put the money in and out of your account and, you know, do that for the first little while and then they can feel comfortable with it. So, um, but yeah, they were totally comfortable with it, fine with it. Um, you've built up that trust and that um, relationship by then to that point that, um, you know, they know. And I mean, the property is in their name. So if anything goes wrong, they're the first ones to get money out. So, yeah. Okay, so, so far we've talked about uh, point number one, which was know your strategy beforehand. If you're doing a flip, you're gonna analyze differently than if you're doing a long-term buy and hold. Know what your strategy is, have a plan B. Point number two was be real in your numbers, be conservative when it comes to your numbers, and know the difference between expected costs, vacancy, repairs and maintenance, things like that, and hard costs. You're gonna have to pay a mortgage. You're gonna be paying property management. You're gonna be paying um, uh, taxes or insurance. Those are your hard costs. Know the difference between what is going to come out of your bank account every month and what you're accounting for to come out of the bank account. You're, you, what you're accounting for in your analyzation of that property. There's a difference between those two things, okay? So, and what that gives us guys is sanity. Because when we know, let's say that we have counted on 300 bucks a month of cash flow from a certain property, but you know, over the last year or two years, it's actually turned out to be more like 600 bucks a month because we haven't had a vacancy and we haven't had those repairs and maintenance, then that's a nice bonus to get. But the opposite is a terrible bonus to get when you've counted on 600 bucks a month in cash flow. Cause on paper, it looked like, yeah, your expenses, hard costs minus income, it's going to be 600 bucks a month. And then it starts happening differently. That's really hard to take emotionally and, and um, it can really throw you and really take you out of the game way too early. So that's what, that's why it's important. It's not just important because we're talking about, you know, know your numbers. It's important because if you can last in real estate long enough to have your mortgages paid off by other people, the markets to go up, rents to go up, equity to appreciate, all of those things all by themselves without you having to do work. That's when really wealth kicks in and freedom and choice kicks in in your life. But a lot of investors don't make it to that point because of things like this. That's where we're going back to basics tonight, saying let's analyze. We we know we know, mm -hmm. but let's get back and some to of these how things, important. Some of these things are just small little mistakes or yeah, we, we didn't think of it big. up front. Um, so a great question here from Solomar, um, getting the reserve from the cash flow. No, we don't want to get the reserve from the cash flow because it will mean that the cash flow will not be received while the reserve is being built. Exactly. That's number one. But number two, you have no money there if something does go wrong while that reserve is being built. So you have a reserve and then you have cash flow. Those are two totally different things. And some of those things, like Tiff said, if a vacancy is not being, if it isn't vacant or there are no repairs, that money helps to build up that reserve even bigger. If at, if at the end of the year you find you are way over and you have more cash flow than you expected, can you split that amount? Absolutely. You can just, as long as you keep a healthy reserve fund going the life of that property um, and anticipate that so, things are going to go wrong. And right? What we did too on a, couple, on a number of properties, and we recommend doing this too, is you know what, if you got a reserve fund, let's say you got 4,500 bucks because that's three months rent and you're like, okay, that's standard. But you know, I'd really feel more comfortable with whatever six grand, eight grand, whatever it might be. You can say to your joint venture partner, why don't just for the first year, why don't we make an agreement that any cash flow that does come in for that first year gets added to? So not creates the reserve fund, but gets added to it. And now so that you still have a nice cushion there, 
But now you've started adding to the reserve fund. And before you know it, within a year, you've got a couple more thousand dollars in there. And that's okay to do with your cash flow. That can absolutely work. But this comes in as part of your closing costs, just like your lawyer's fee, just like your appraisals and all that stuff. There's a reserve fund fee as well. Yeah. So one of the things that we wanted to go over today was showing you a, an example of a vacancy market report that CMHC puts out. And how we have and to decipher Some it. of the things that you want to look for in there, some of the things you, you, you know, you, we don't want to put too much weight on it, but I'm going to share my screen with you and show you a sample one. This happens to be here in Edmonton. Why did I pick Edmonton? Because I know Edmonton, uh, this is where we have been investing. So I'm going to show you an example. Now, CMHC does this for markets all across Canada. You can find this for markets all across Canada. I'm just showing an example of what Edmonton looks like and how you can analyze these types CMHC? of numbers. It is from CMHC. Oh, okay. okay, so here we go. I'm going to share the screen. And this is the rental market and, report is and, what they call it. And for those of you coming from, from, in, from the States and watching from the States, there are all kinds of some very similar reports you can get all over the place. So yeah. you, you just got to dig from within your area. So a couple of things I want to go over on here. Number one, do you notice this here date released? <laughs> okay. Wow. So it's 2020. Now, one thing that CMHC does is they do their reports in October of every single year, once per year. That's October. So this was uh, from October of 2019 till October of 2020. That's what this report will um, will be showing. Okay, so is this today's? Okay, and has, or if I'm looking at this in April or May or June of next year, this will still be the most recent report that CMHC will have released. And as we know, markets can change based on commodities, like our market is based on just in migration, like the you know Toronto Vancouver markets have changed. Um, based on COVID, yes, <laughs> you know, anything absolutely. can change so Based fast. on the weather. So, uh, you know, Edmonton is always sells less than it does in the summer because no one wants to move in the winter. So what else do we look for on here? So I'm just going to show you, and this is what we touched on earlier when it comes to vacancy rates, is that you can see um, the darker blue means higher vacancy, okay? The lighter the blue means less vacancy. So what you're looking for on here is light blue the light blue areas less vacancy you can see in edmonton it happens to be around the surrounding part of the city that's where we've always told investors opposite to be buying in edmonton for years but opposite to what is most cities in a lot right of other cities most yeah. cities it's the more central you are not in our urban sprawling city of edmonton but if i was to just go and say edmonton's vacancy rate is 4.9 percent and i bought in downtown Edmonton expecting that or in Strathcona County expecting 4.9% and I was doing my numbers based on 4.9%. Do you see what we would be getting here? Okay, we would be getting higher vacancy, much higher. This that's above the census metropolitan area, which is what CMA stands for, it would be above that. So I wouldn't be doing my numbers properly. Now, what does the size of the circle mean? The size of the circle, we want big circles because big circles means it's above average rent. So when we're looking at this map, we want light blue and we want big circles. <laughs> that is a very simple way of showing us what areas of the city or outside of the city in the metropolitan area we might want to be investing in. So looking at these reports, the reason I'm sharing this today is just to show you that this gives us a slight idea that one part of town can be different from another part of town. And just like for those of you that were here when I was telling the story of how our market was at 3% um, and our, our properties were flying off the shelves. Oh, I was just going to show, but anyways, it's still there. So that little dot, this one of the smallest ones toward the left side of the screen, um, mm -hmm. Jasper Place, that was the area that had a 14% vacancy at the same time that the rest of our city had 3% vacancy, according to CMHC, okay, so apples to apples. Now the real, on the streets, we were, we were you know, at 1%-ish, they said, which is essentially zero. But, um, but, but Jasper Place, people were flocking to you it saying, what? That, that is exactly the point that I was going to make because you look at this here. We have West Jasper Place, which is below average vacancy and higher than average rent. 
And we have Jasper Place here that is a completely the opposite, below average rent and higher than average vacancy. Yeah. And that is such a small area that is separated there. So these are the things Perfect. that are so important to be looking for. Because if I based my numbers, if I was buying in in Jasper Place, but I based my numbers based on Spruce Grove or, or even the Edmonton average at 4.9%, but I bought in Jasper Place and here I find out that it's at 10%, 12%, whatever it might be. Now I'm in, I'm in trouble. And as an out of town investor, I'm in more trouble because I can't jump in and just do what needs to get done. So at the end of the day, guys, what you have to do is remember you need to get micro in your analysis. Okay. So macro is looking from a, you know, bird's eye view. Good. I've got, you know, a market analysis. I'm looking at different markets. Um, by the way, we're going to, in the new year, we're going we're gonna to start bringing on specialists from different markets across Canada to tell us all about those markets. So, so that we can help you do some of that research, but you still have to do your own buck stops with you. It's your money. But one other thing I wanted to say when it comes to that rental market report, and yes, this is available for, I think almost every center across Canada that has more than 50,000 people. Okay. So then CMHC publishes a report on like even towns. Now, the other thing I wanted to say and Tiff alluded to this earlier is that this is the primary rental market report okay so the secondary rental market report which is all of us that have you know 10 5 1 100 properties we don't report to cmhc about our vacancies so we're not included in this report this is just apartment buildings uh bachelor to three bedroom plus uh but it gives us a general idea but we got to remember that the numbers can be outdated this is for only big corporations renting apartments uh, this does not apply to the secondary rental market, but it can still at the same time give Maybe us a I'm general idea you. of what's happening in particular neighborhoods around our our city, our town that we're looking to invest in. But very clearly, our one of our main points of tonight is to say these numbers are not numbers that you can count on. You're using them, you're learning from them, but you have to dig deeper. So you want to talk to the property managers in the area and find out what is your vacancy rate as a property manager? You know, how many units do you manage and how many of them are empty? I mean, you want to talk to the local landlord and tenant boards, the local, you know, groups and associations. That's the kind of places. So Earshad asked, you know, do we have one for Halifax? Um, we don't, but CMHC should. So yep, you'd be absolutely. able to find that. Um, if you Google Henrietta, CMHC vacancy Henriette, market report, sorry. then the link for that will come up. You can put in which year. And here's the other thing, guys, is that not only would I be looking, if I'm looking to invest in a market, I wouldn't just be looking at 2019's numbers. What was it in 2018, 2017, 2016? Look, is it, are there trends occurring? Is there one area that was high vacancy and now it's low or vice versa? Start looking at trends that you're seeing over the years. That's the point of doing this. And that's why we're talking about this tonight is market or not market, property analysis. If we're looking to buy this property over here, why is that one better than this property over here? The location of that property can make a big difference when we're running our numbers and when we're analyzing our numbers. So Henriette, I believe your question is about the economy in Alberta being bad. How do we raise rents? Insurance went up. Yeah. So I often just say to my tenants, um, so you've probably heard about insurance going up across Alberta. It's crazy. And it's actually affected your, our property too, the one that, you know, your home, our property. Um, and so unfortunately we have to raise rents this year. I really tried to keep it as low as I could. Um, but your rent is going to be going up by this much. Now, interestingly, I was just reading a, port, a report today that talked about how, yeah, our rents, um, you know, for one, in Alberta, we can raise rents however much we want, as long as it's once a year. But secondly, the beauty of it is that since 2015, very interestingly, when our um, incomes in Alberta were the highest in the country because our economy was steamrolling ahead, as it has been for the last how many years? And since then, we've gone into this you know, recession, we could call it, um, if not depression now that might maybe with COVID being here. But interestingly, our um, wages are still the highest in the country and have actually gone up by $140 per week, per week, and are the highest in the country over Toronto, over Vancouver. So can our tenants still afford the rents that are here? Absolutely. We have the lowest affordability um, in most than most of, of, of Canada. So can you raise rents? Yes. Do you do it compassionately? Yes. Do you do it person to person? 
yes, absolutely. But can you, can it be done? For sure. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Grant, I just see all of his notes and stuff, man. <laughs> this like wholly um, detail oriented. We should have you. Uh, we should have <laughs> you write these things up. Um, okay, so let's move on to number four mistakes. So we've got uh, yeah, we've got time. We've got nine minutes. So mistakes that we see being made. So guys, here's the number one mistake. I did it more times than I can count. I analyzed the numbers, but guess what? And tell me if you guys have done this. Come on and be honest with me. Who here has analyzed a property and tried their best to make it work? You tried just, to fudge the numbers as best they could to make it look it good. You want it to work, right? <laughs> you love it for whatever reason. If you've reason. done that, put a Y or a yes in the comments because you know what? Uh, we've done it. Um, and oh, I know a lot of other investors that are uh, successful and not successful that have done it. And it is something that we really want to try to get you to stay away from. Have you done it? Yes or no? <laughs> Put it in the comments. Yes. Uh, guilty is charged. It's really hard not to, guys. It's hard so to find good property it, sometimes, right? It is. So here's here's a, it sounds like me, 100%. Guilty is charged. Yeah. So here's a good rule of thumb, guys. When you analyze your numbers, once you've got the numbers properly put in, within the first or maybe second time, because sometimes we have to guess at a couple of numbers and then we have to go confirm those numbers and come back and, and you know, make them better. But if you find yourself going back to your spreadsheet or whatever you use to analyze properties and you find that you're, well, maybe I can, well, you know what though, this, this place is an up and coming area and you know what, it just got a new fridge, so I'm not gonna have that. So maybe I can put 8% for a maintenance fund instead of 10% or maintenance fee. Um, well, you know what, I'm going to be self-managing this one and I'm sure I'll do it for at least five, six years. So I don't have to put in a property management fee at all. That is probably the biggest thing that we see is, is not including the property management fee in because I'm planning to do it myself. And that is, that is okay. But here's the thing. Chances are, especially if you become successful at this and, and let's plan guys right from the start to become successful at this and buy more than one property. You are going to want to hand that off at some point. I promise you. Is no, property management is is extremely difficult. It's not the part of the okay, business that you I want to do. I just had one hell of so, a day doing it, and I'm 18 years in, but I took <laughs> it back a couple of years ago and and started doing it myself. So you again. have to account for the cost. Yep. And I tell you, some days I'm like, what the hell am I doing? But it keeps me in the market. It keeps me in the know. It keeps me connected to what you guys are doing every day. So it's really important that I keep doing it. But I tell you. I was ready to pull my hair out. So today. tons of yeses. Tons Everybody of yeses. is very being very honest <laughs> yeah, and awesome. humble. Thank it. you guys for for putting in that comment because it is what we do sometimes, and so it's normal. If you but find your sorry, what we want to do is not do that. We don't want to be doing that. We don't want to have to massage them. But you're never going to catch yourself and be like, "Oh, I'm fudging numbers here." Hmm. But what we do often, and this is what you can kind of catch yourself in easily, is if you find yourself going back and changing the numbers a little bit um, for whatever reason that you've been able to um, make up in your head, um, that might be a clue that you're too emotional about the property and that you need to take a step back. Okay, so um, playing with your numbers, mistakes number one, or playing with your numbers to force them because you've fallen in love, okay? Um, not planning for your lifestyle within your numbers. So, you know, there might be properties, let's say, we'll use that example. For those of you that know Edmonton's market, and we are gonna have an Edmonton market expert come in in January, so we'll learn more about the market then. But, um, you know, let's say that you buy in those some of those areas with the high vacancy and the tough tenant demographic and all of those things because the numbers look good on paper they do they look pretty good but you didn't take into account that you know maybe right now you're you know young and single or maybe your kids are grown and everything's fine and you're in good health what if in five years you're not in good health anymore and you're a whole lot more tired and your career is at its like biggest gusto point where you're really having to focus on it and you don't have time for the extras or your kids are now you now have kids you know you got to take into account your lifestyle so when you're analyzing a property it's not mm -hmm. just all about those numbers because if you want to be standing 18 years in when your properties are almost paid off and when you're you know rents and cash flow are actually there for real instead of just on paper 
you want to make sure that you've accounted for your lifestyle so that you can make it that That is fun. such an important point. And we say this over and over again. We've named our company after this strategy. But, you know, investing meets lifestyle. Uh, having an investor life. You have to have a life while you do this. You have to reward yourself while you do this. You have to see some benefits from doing this. That is so, so, so important. And what we see are the mistakes that, that people make is that they're working their arse off trying to do these things and they're not enjoying it at all. They do it for a year or two. They make the wrong decisions up front and they're out of this business and they say real estate investing sucks and it didn't work for me. Well, yes, it won't work for you if that's the way you go about doing it. So what we're trying to do here is yep, set the bar differently. We're trying to uh, let's go about doing this in a way that you can reward yourself now. You can enjoy a lifestyle now. You can buy the right properties that won't kill you along the way. And you can actually last the 5, 10, 15, 20 years you need to last for the cash flow for the mortgage pay down for the equity to all appreciate. So this this is the important part that sometimes gets missed in this process. Just gonna throw in a few of these comments here. So I love this, Grant says, property management Absolutely. is a hard cost and an expense. And if we think of it that way, that's not negotiable, whereas lots of us put it as a negotiable expense on our performance, but it's not, it is indeed a hard cost. So uh, Liz, what happened today? I'll just, I can tell you about it in our Ignited session. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been a fun day. Um, property management didn't account for it the first few. Yeah, we didn't either, Sean and Heidi, even with our joint venture properties, we didn't. And I tell you, you know, we, we've paid for it over the years. I've worked for many years for free for some of our joint venture partners because we didn't account for it. Because why? We were trying to push those numbers. Oh, well, if we put property management in, it's not going to cash flow. So we better not. Um, so yeah, yeah, guilty as charged. Solomar. art. 10% would be the minimum I would put in any any analyzation of a property because yes, you do have those extra charges. Um, you know, I would and easily not put in 12, 14%, but you know, Depends that's on your where area. it comes down to speaking with property manager, managers prior to even making a purchase. Ask them, what are the easiest properties for you guys to manage? Maybe that'll give you a hint as to what type of properties to go mm -hmm. forward and buy. Um, I love that. Uh, Irshad, good job and uh, for you getting your property. That's awesome. It's exciting stuff. And um, okay, I think we're good with the comments now. Um, last two things were we have we're two running minutes, out of time. But I just wanted to say two things. So pro tips. Now, th th this is Corey's okay. pro tips for buying yeah. these properties. So number one, complete your diligence on that property during your conditional period. What I see a lot of people do is they are researching and analyzing and going through everything they need to go through and they haven't even put in an offer yet. And then they go to put in an offer and either the property is gone or the offer does not get completed for one reason or another. So your, you have a diligence period after you have an accepted offer because you have conditions of inspection, you have conditions of financing, whatever conditions you put in there, give yourself the time to do the diligence after you have an accepted offer on a property you can actually buy and do it cram it in there in the five, six, uh, 14 days that you have during your conditional period. That's when the diligence happens. And once that diligence is complete, that's what we call you've done your due diligence. Okay, and the last thing too, and you can make that part of your um, offer as well, but what you want to write in your offer for sure is that you're gonna have contractors and showings perhaps come in. And can you do this in every market? No, sometimes you can't, but, um, but if you can, write into your offer. You're gonna have contractors coming in during um, that conditional period so that you can do, the, you know, you can be one step ahead on this kind Absolutely. of stuff. I'm just gonna throw, you know, Sean and Heidi, that's the beauty of it. We make our mistakes with our own money sometimes. And then once we move on to JVs, we don't have to make those mistakes anymore. Yep. And good for you because I've been working for some of my joint venture partners for literally 18 years, 17 years. Um, for free for property management because I never accounted for it. So you learned a lot earlier than I did. So hopefully um, tonight, guys, you got a few little nuggets here and there that um, can help you to make good decisions when it comes to analyzing your properties, to be real when you're analyzing them, to look at the real numbers and to, to notice the difference between vacancy rates like we talked about. And there's so many different, micro. you know, we could probably talk about this for 10 hours straight about all the little details that go into it. But 
Uh, the point of it all is, is make sure you take your time analyzing before you buy a property. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't want to be stuck with something that's going to take you out of this game because the benefits of buying the right property are awesome and it's worth it. It's uh, worth just it. do the research prior. Okay. Thanks, Y. And everybody else that's joined us tonight. And um, we will see you ignited over on our laser. It's going to be as if you were a minute late. So we'll see you guys over there right away. And we've got a full one tonight. Yay. And um, yeah, we'll see the rest of you guys next week for Tactical Training Tuesday. I don't remember what the topic is. Um, <laughs> and then come January again, we're going to start doing the market reports with uh, our experts. In yeah, we have a location. super cool 2021 coming up. Yeah. But uh, closing off 2020 is going to be awesome too. So we'll see you guys next week on another Tactical Tuesday. Cheers, everyone. Good night.